Well, um, it's three o'clock in my time. So good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening to everyone who already joined us. Uh, welcome to the web webinar, Driving the Agroecological Transition. My name is Gabriela vider Guerra. I'm from the Alliance Biodiversity SIAT, and it is my pleasure to be here today as your moderator. So first thing first, I would like to start our meeting today uh, briefly introducing today's agenda. Um, we will first start with an opening from the European Commission from GI4, uh, followed by some brief introductory words as well from Marcela Quintero. Uh, we will then have a presentation from Fergus and Claire on scaling agroecology, uh, followed by the two core parts, uh, which are two panels. Starting with the first panel where the transitions uh, project leads are going to present uh, transitions and then followed by a second panel uh, where we will be joined by esteemed panelists, which will debate on what is needed to enable agroecological transitions in practice, but also how drivers uh, such as metrics, digital tools, in incentives and investments uh, be most effective to achieve large scale change. Um, we, after the two panels, we're gonna have a, a question and answer space. Uh, so we encourage uh, everyone who joined us uh, to share their questions in the Q&A window. I'll share a bit more of the technical information shortly. Um, and then to close the today's webinar, we will have some closing remarks from Sara Sabastano from IFAD. In terms of some technical aspects, as we always introduce in our webinars, um, this event will be recorded. We already started the recording. Uh, this would be used uh, for public posting, but also to share with those who could not attend today live. Um, the chat function for today's webinar uh, is disabled as we would really like to encourage people to use the Q&A window. Uh, sometimes the chat gets overcrowded um, and the questions are get lost. So this is really to encourage and to get the most out of all questions and that we don't miss any of them. So we really want to ensure to capture all of this uh, questions during the, the throughout the, the webinars, uh, today's webinar. Um, additionally, we will not be opening my microphones today uh, for the audience. So everyone has the same opportunity through the questions that you can pose through the Q&A window. Um, we therefore again encourage and welcome you to share your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we would appreciate or it would be best if you can indicate to whom you are um, sharing the question for um, so we can then direct it uh, to that person. Um, some of these questions are going to be answered through writing throughout the webinar. Um, so uh, also please keep in mind that you can thumb up the questions so they will go up in ranking. And you can also comment on the questions as well in the Q&A window. So once again, please, uh, we welcome you to share your questions and comment uh, throughout the, the webinar as well through there. Questions can be posed in English and French and, and Spanish, um, in English, sorry. And, and we, we will then direct them to, to, our, to our panelists. Um, so now I would like to, to start with the, with the webinar. And I would like to introduce uh, Guy Four, who's the senior policy officer in charge of research and innovation in the European Commission of the Di Directorate General International Partnership. He's one of transitions, uh, European Commission is one of the transitions donor. So I pass on the mic to you, Guy. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, first, I'm very happy to be there because it was a long process to get uh, to the transition project on track. So it's a good news to start uh, uh, the project. Uh, first, I want to, to uh, talk about the EU policy regarding the Green Deal, which is the main uh, new policy for the European Union, and the Farm to Fork strategy to address the food system uh, uh, transition, transformation, uh, aiming at uh, reducing the use of uh, external inputs to avoid contamination in intensive agriculture, uh, to limit uh, contamination, to limit waste of food, and to increase uh, 
uh, a circular economy and to increase uh, nutrition issues. Uh, for us, uh, ag for us, uh, agroecology is part of the solution we can uh, uh, promote uh, for achieving the farm to fork uh, strategy objectives. So it's quite important for us. So we support at uh, international partnership uh, general directorate. We support agroecology in different policy and uh, different programs and in different projects and. Uh, as uh, you are fully aware, it's not so easy to support such uh, an approach in this context when you have a lot of crisis. And the last one with uh, war in Ukraine, uh, with a lot of push to try to, to limit uh, some uh, progresses uh, regarding uh, this, uh, this uh, strategy. Uh, the second point, uh, we at uh, the General Directorate INPA, we really support research and innovation, which is quite important to support agroecology, to make sure agroecology can really achieve uh, the expected uh, outcomes and impacts. So we need research and innovation, but uh, we want to strengthen uh, research innovation based on some principles. The first one is to have uh, to have research innovation uh, able to address systemic issue and uh, to really address complex problems with different uh, uh, entry points and not uh, working on silo. The second uh, principle is partnerships because innovation is a question of involving different types of stakeholders, farmers, farmers organization, NGO, private sector, public authority and for sure research. So the type of partnership, which could uh, take different forms, innovation platforms, living labs and so on, is something very important as uh, the transition project is aiming to strengthen too. And the last principle is based on uh, how we can strengthen capacities of actors to innovate researchers and research organization, but also other actors to be able to really address the, uh, the, the challenges. So in this case, uh, regarding our general directorate general INPA, uh, we fund research and innovation projects through different mechanisms. The first one is a DESRA initiative. We fund uh, around 80 uh, projects in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, many of them oriented to uh, agroecology uh, to support these uh, food system transitions. We are working on new phase of DESIRA, especially in Africa, to, to address agroecological issues with research uh, and other actors. And we also uh, support research innovation through the CGIR. We are fully involved in the CGIR uh, uh, reform uh, uh, to strengthen a more unified governance and to, to strengthen or to design and implement a more current scientific portfolio. And uh, that tr transition is part of uh, this effort to support uh, uh, this uh, CGIR reform with uh, renovated portfolio and uh, with uh, ambitious objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, highly appreciate it. Appreciate it to for you to be here. And I want to take advantage to uh, welcome everyone who has just joined. We already started with with the webinar. And now I would like to pass it on to Marcela Quintero, who's the Associate Director of uh, General Research Strategy and Innovation of the Alliance Biodiversity and CIAT. And she's also the lead of the Agroecology Initiative. Uh, over to you, Marcela. Thank you, Gabby. And uh, thank you everyone for joining this event. I'm very proud as well of doing the opening of this program. As Guy said, it, it has been a long journey to arrive to this point. Uh, the Agroecological Transitions Program uh, is for building resilient and inclusive agricultural and food systems. And as noted by Guy, uh, this program and by this program and others, there is a greater recognition that agroecological approaches 
are increasingly promoted as a means to promote sustainable development outcomes of food systems. So that means ensuring regenerative use of natural resources and ecosystem services while addressing the need for more socially equitable decision making. And I think this is, this is super important, especially in low and middle income countries. This specific program also acknowledged that there are some limitations to, uh, to do this transition uh, at a faster speed. And then uh, this program concentrates its efforts on supporting farmers in uh, tackling some of these limitations. The first one is rela in relation to metrics to assess agroecology and to assess the progress in that transition towards agroecology. The second one has to be with incentive and investment. And there is a greater recognition that agroecology needs more investment from different actors, not only public sector, but also private sector. And also the need for better tools that ensure that this transition is inclusive, but also technically sound. So by saying this, I will also uh, would like to say that, uh, and, and also make a, a recognition of the collective work that different organization has done to put this program together. So thank you for to the European Union for funding this, but also to IFAD, who is the manager uh, of this program. And then also thank you to C4 ICRAF, the Alliance of Biodiversity and CIAD as part of the CIAR, the University of Vermont, who have put uh, together uh, this program and have made a big effort to make sure that it's consistent with uh, the, the, the challenges that we want to tackle. And also I would like to mention that this, uh, this program is part of the Agroecology TPP. I don't know if all of you are familiar with this Agroecology TPP, but it's a transformative plat partnership platform on agroecology that is also a collective effort of different actors to uh, convene different efforts on agroecology and oriented to close the implementation and knowledge gap. I'm sure you are going to be listening also more about this agroecology TPP, but this is just to say that it's really a quite a, a good momentum right now because uh, many organizations are, we are now convening and recognizing that there is a need for an agroecological transition. So we are now aligning our efforts towards kind of contributing to a faster uh, transition towards agroecology. So with this, uh, Gabby, I would like then to officially open this event and thank you everyone uh, that is are connected today. Thank you very much, uh, Marcela. And once again, thank you very much, Guy. I think with this um, introductory remarks, we started a really good webinar, um, stressing the key points of ecology, but that's been done through this program. Uh, with this, I would like to pass on to the to the next point in our agenda, and I would like to pass on the work to Fergus Sinclair, Chief Scientist of C4 ECRAF, who Marcela already shortly introduced, and he's going to be speaking a bit about scaling agroecology. So over to you, Fergus. Okay, thank you. Can I get the first slide, uh, Fabian? So I think that we're all, um, uh, can you put it in presentation mode? Yeah, I, I, we're all clear that, that agroecology is a systemic response to interacting global challenges of climate change, uh, broken food systems leading to, to hunger, um, biodiversity loss and widespread land and water degradation, which is an existential issue in that it undermines um, uh, food systems. Next slide. And using the 13 principles of agroecology from the high level panel of experts of the Committee on World, World Food Security. Next slide. Um, there is um, clearly a number of areas of action um, that, uh, that are needed. We need to create a level playing field um, so that agroecological approaches are being judged um, uh, in uh, a comparative way with other alternatives. We need to be able to embrace complexity because trying to farm more in harmony with nature means that you need to use more species, you need to um, work with nature rather than forcing systems 
um, with, with chemicals. And that creates greater variability and is more knowledge intensive. And we need to enable integration both horizontally across sectors and, and vertically uh, across scales. Next slide, please. And in order to do that, um, the transitions program has a theory of change that relates um, the uh, three key uh, elements that Marcella has already mentioned. Uh, and those are the development of holistic metrics. Now, these are metrics um, not of how agroecological something is, but metrics for agricultural systems that allow us to evaluate in a broad sense, bringing in what have been externalities previously in terms of the impact of agriculture on the environment and on social equity and, and other key aspects that the really important outcomes and, and really important ways in which we can judge whether one alternative is, is, is better than another. Then we've got um, um, a, a critical requirement for digital tools that help us to embrace complexity and, and provide advice and to be inclusive. And that's a real challenge because a lot of the development of digital uh, agriculture has been around centralization of, of power and of control. Uh, but in an agroecological context, we want to use that to empower farmers. And then there's, of course, this critical issue of, of public and private investment and appropriate business models, inclusive business models that allow agroecological transitions to work and for um, uh, producers and other value chain actors to gain um, um, capture sufficient value um, uh, and particularly close to the producers to make it all viable. And also there is the need for us to be addressing things at this whole system level and to be taking the social uh, as much uh, and cultural uh, uh, as well as all of the other aspects into account. Next slide, please. So um, the way in which these um, key um, uh, uh, elements of the project interact are really quite strong, as you can imagine. So digital tools obviously use holistic metrics and provide uh, data um, um, uh, and test those metrics. Um, business models, again, uh, both use metrics um, um, and we need metrics that encompass uh, those business impacts. And of course, uh, digital tools can um, um, very much help advancing um, um, investment decisions. Next slide, please. And as Marcella has already mentioned, this uh, project, uh, this program uh, sits within uh, the transformative partnership platform, um, which is a, 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 um, very much a, a bottom up um, uh, program. It connects global research institutions to local action. So the local action happens in a range of engagement landscapes around the world, uh, and they drive then the priorities for uh, international research. And the TPP is growing very quickly. It began um, as a result uh, of the um, uh, CFS report, the HLP report on, on agroecology and a number of other events in, in 2019 and was officially launched in, in, in 2021. And next slide, please, um, was instrumental in developing the coalition, um, uh, the Agroecology Coalition, which came out of the UN Food Systems Summit, um, which, uh, next slide, please, um, which um, uh, is, is, is essentially um, um, uh, came from the Group of Friends of Agroecology um, and the CFS and, and, and the TPP um, uh, pushing to get agroecology into the pre-summit and then uh, um, the coalition came out. Next slide, please. It's a coalition of the willing, and I think that's really important. It comprises 40 um, countries, including the European Union um, uh, Commission, the uh, African Union and ECOWAS. Um, uh, uh, and it's got countries in Africa, uh, the Americas, um, uh, uh, Asia, uh, and Europe. Um, and the key thing is, is 
uh, is, is being a coalition of the willing leading to action? Because quite often within UN processes, things are slowed down by uh, uh, whoever is, is the slowest, the, the, the most reluctant. Um, and that's tended to water things down. And we saw that between the recommendations in the HLP report and the final uh, CFS uh, recommendation, policy recommendations. Um, what's great about the coalition is it's people who want to take agroecology forward doing so, and others uh, can then follow from those examples. So this represents a fantastic um, uh, science policy interface for uh, the transitions program uh, with uh, a load of countries really looking for guidance that this program can give that they will take up and take forward and scale up what uh, transitions puts forward. Thank you. Thank you, Fergus, and thank you for this great overview of the transitions program, but also on the TPP and the Agroecology Coalition. Um, I want to remind people that um, each uh, that you can post questions on the Q and A. Please uh, refer to the name to whom you want to refer it. Um, especially now that we enter the first panel um, with that great intervention from Fergus, I would like now to pass it on to the to the first panel when we're going to have three separate presentations uh, regarding the transitions project. So we're going to go in a bit more deeper to the overview Fergus just gave. Um, I would first like to introduce uh, Cristina Lamana. Uh, he, she's a climate change decision scientist from C4 ECRAF, and she will be giving us more information on the metrics. Over to you, Christine. Great. Thanks, Gabby, and good morning, everyone. Um, could we have the slides, please? Great. So it's my pleasure to present to you an overview of first of the three projects underneath the transitions program on holistic metrics for agroecology. Next. And you might be thinking, well, why an entire project on metrics? Well, metrics are really a value statement. Metrics give us information on what we consider to be important and are the currency that enables decision making. Currently, our metrics of agriculture and food systems tend to be narrowly focused on agricultural productivity, things like yield or profitability. This approach fails to capture the important impacts of agriculture on environmental, social, and livelihood dimensions that we know are critical to both development and sustainability. Next. By developing holistic metrics of agricultural systems that account for these multiple impacts on things like biodiversity, nutrition, uh, empowerment, connectivity, um, economic opportunities, we can really create a level playing field for agroecological approaches that address all of these dimensions and enable transitions to agroecology. So in short, we need to measure what matters. Next. The way the metrics project is doing this is through three main objectives. The first is to develop and test a novel set of performance metrics for agriculture and food systems that allow this holistic approach, but are actually still practical to use in the field. Second is to develop guidance and training on the use of these holistic performance metrics for different types of decision makers and metrics users from project managers to national or subnational governments, businesses, and donors. And finally, our third objective is to position holistic metrics to be able to inform management, planning, policy, and investment decisions if those decisions are currently only being made with a more narrow focus on agricultural productivity. Next. The way we're doing this is through a research and development approach. <clears throat> What this means is we're partnering with ongoing agroecological projects in an action research approach. We're going to be working in the eight countries that you see at the bottom of your screen across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The reason to do this is so that we can work in a diversity of contexts, different farming systems, so different, different crop types, livestock types, climates, uh, and agroecologies. 
these countries are also in different types of agroecological transitions, some from low input systems and agricultural agroecological intensification, and others are more reconfiguring existing systems. And finally, to work at different scales, uh, interventions in agroecology can happen at the plot level or at landscape level and system level. So we need to have metrics that can address all of these. Next. Just to quickly introduce you to two of the projects that we're working in, one in Kenya is a dryland restoration project, which is focused on improving low input, low productivity agricultural systems through soil water management, agroforestry, and also gender transformative approaches. Next. And in India, we'll be partnering with the Andhra Pradesh Community Managed Natural Farming Program, which is more reconfiguring higher input farming systems through diversification, minimum tillage, and organic agriculture. And this project is really a social mobilization, as well as being strongly supported by the state government. Next. The metrics project intends to produce three main outputs. The first is this novel suite of metrics that uh, enables the assessment of agroecology at different scales and different contexts. Second is a database of metrics so that diverse users can develop and their own monitoring systems and approaches um, utilizing the suite of metrics that are available currently, as well as novel ones that are developed in the project. And finally, guidelines on the use of these metrics for diverse users and measurement goals from impact assessment to project management to system performance. Next, and go ahead next again. Some initial insights from the work we've been doing is that there are a lot of metrics available, um, but many of them are again, focused on quantitative indicators um, that we can easily measure. So things like productivity and soil health, whereas dimensions we know are critical to agroecology, such as, connectivity, equity, empowerment, uh, participation are much less represented um, in the metrics that are available. Next. Christine, uh, we I'm have done. to start finishing, yeah. <laughs> That's it. So I hope that I have convinced you that if we actually start to measure what matters uh, within agriculture and food systems, the benefits of agroecology become clear and we can enable transitions to agroecology and more sustainable food systems. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christine. And with that great closure, uh, it really resonates. And as well, it's exciting to hear uh, about more action research approach and really defining metrics according to the context uh, by taking into account different um, systems, but also scales. So um, kudos on that. Now I would like to pass it on to Lini Verlenberg, a food and climate specialist from the Alliance of Biodiversity and SIAT and the Gunt Institute. She will be introducing us a bit more on inclusive digital tools as part of the Transform Transitions program. Over to you, Lini. Thank you, Gabby. May I have the slides, please? Wonderful. Next slide. So while we live in an increasingly digital world, as Fergus said, smallholders are being left behind and digital resources in agriculture are for the most part, not accessible and not relevant to smallholders needs. Next slide, please. So the inclusive digital tools project of agroecological transitions is focused on improving the inclusiveness of digital resources for smallholders by focusing on performance assessment and technical advisory tools that can help us scale up practices and testing specifically how smallholders and scientists or extension agents can co-create farm practices for both agroecology and climate change. Next slide, please. We're doing this through action research in Brazil and Vietnam. So we're going in deep in, in two countries. And the idea, the, the main activity is to test this co-creation of innovations in the digital ecosystem. In Brazil, we're focused on the beef supply chain, uh, very high emissions and many sustainability issues, and in Vietnam on the rice supply chain. And the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT together with their action partners are working in Brazil while ERI is working with their action partners in Vietnam. Uh, the types of action partners that we're working with are farm advisory organizations like Solidaridad in Brazil or the, um, or uh, Vicolto in Vietnam, 
as well as best practice platforms, tool developers, uh, corporates, and local and national government. Next slide, please. So I wanna share with you uh, three sets of findings. Although this is our launch seminar, we've uh, actually started the project as early as January this year. And so we have a few results. And the first is a global review that we've done of digital tools with respect to agroecology and climate change, and to assess them according to 90 different indicators, um, especially as to how inclusive they are, to what extent they include agroecology, to what extent they include climate change and so on. So here are the results for the agroecology features. Across the 200 tools, we found 44 that had any features related to agroecology as defined by these 12 indicators in the graph. And as you can see at the, at the bottom of the graph, uh, we have, as you would expect, productivity income um, to be the indicator that is highest. But then interestingly, co-creation and sharing of knowledge um, and efficiency and input reduction are the next two highest features that are in these 44 tools. Um, but maybe more importantly, among the 44 tools, we didn't find large numbers of these principles. So only about a quarter, one third of the tools addressed more than four of the principles, right? So we don't have a lot of completeness of agroecology across the different tools. And about half of the tools included whole system design features such as integrated pest management or agroforestry. So um, we're doing okay on that score. About 25% had farmer-driven content, such as agro-advisory videos recorded by farmers. So that seems uh, you know, somewhat um, reasonable, but still on, on the low end. And then 43%, so much better, had two-way communication um, techniques uh, allowing farmers to provide input into a tool, for example, or to a, a resource, uh, SMS voice calling or in-app communication uh, with some really interesting innovations, for example, uh, connecting the digital resource to a call center where farmers could ask for advice. Next slide, please. The second set of, of um, results that I want to share is a review of principles that we did, where we looked at 30 different uh, documents, different standards, uh, different analyses, different recommendations for farmer co-creation of practices. Um, and, and we actually looked at inclusiveness generally. And what we found was that while there are many principles related to of social inclusion and digital development, there are not very many around how farmers can, can be involved in practices, in developing better practices. Um, and so we tried to uh, cull from that larger list five major principles that we thought were um, most relevant to farmer co-creation of practices. The first being engage diverse farmers. And I should say there are uh, two to four sub-principles for all of these um, five principles, but the first is, you know, can you engage with the maximum diversity of farmers relevant to your tool? How can you improve their access and afford it, uh, the affordability of the tool to them? Third, how can you co-create practices with farmers, make the tools uh, acknowledge farmers' context, allow farmers to co-work co, uh, on solutions and, in, and enable them to um, communicate both ways? How can you use technology aptly so uh, understanding the need for human intermediaries where possible, or uh, maybe not even using technology in some cases. Technology can also have uh, downsides. And finally, managing data and tools responsibly. Next slide, please. And the mm -hmm. last set of re results Sorry. that I want to share, this is my final slide. Uh, the last one that I want to share is the regional digital ecosystems uh, studies that we're doing in the two regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lini. Um, I think there are some exciting questions coming in uh, through the Q&A box on, on digital tools, uh, but also some other uh, really exciting questions on metrics as well. Uh, with this, I want to remind everyone to please go ahead and use the Q&A box to, to pose all your questions. Um, now I would like to introduce Jonathan Mokshel. Uh, he's an agricultural economist, decision and policy analysis in the uh, decision and policy analysis research area of the Alliance of Biodiversity and SIAD. He will be now uh, introducing us to incentives and investments. Over to you, Jonathan. On behalf of a larger team from the Alliance of Biodiversity SIAD and also International Water Management Institute, I'm presenting the project three, which is on private sector incentives and investment for climate change, resilience and environmental sustainability. And as we already know, the food system is currently going through several crises. 
climate change is one of the huge problems, um, environmental degradation, uh, pollution. We also have post-COVID-19 era, uh, which is affecting supply chains and increasing food prices uh, across different parts of the world. We have conflicts, uh, conflicts uh, external and also internal, affecting uh, prices of key inputs for producing food and also leading to increasing food prices. And all this sum up is what we see now in terms of the increasing number of people who are malnourished and also hunger in the world. All these changes, as we see in terms of the crisis, which I call the three C's plus hunger, is affecting how we want to achieve the sustainable development goals. And if this is not checked, we are going to have major challenges. Agroecology represents a paradigm shift from the business as usual scenario that we have to transition to a more sustainable food system, which also helps to adapt to climate change and also ensure environmental sustainability. However, we also see that the private sector is currently aligning to sustainability principles and also to agroecology um, in a nutshell. But there is also growing concerns and some of these concerns is about the incentives and investment mechanisms of the private sector, the motivation and also transparency. So we have a double-edged sword now. As much as the private sector is engaging, we also see growing concerns. And sometimes this is labeled as just greenwashing, which creates a puzzle for us. We want to address this problem through four main objectives. Number one is to develop inclusive incentive structure for private sector and public sector stakeholders. Number two, leverage private and public sector investments to drive the transitions. Three, increase transparency and traceability in supply chains. And four, work with the local um, institutions and also build capacity and co-design solutions that are critical for the transitions to happen. We'll be working across three main value chains, landscapes across three different countries. So in Peru, we'll be looking into cocoa value chains or landscapes. In Vietnam, rice landscapes, and then in Ethiopia, wheat value chains. And this will be in partnership with key stakeholders within the countries. So far, in terms of unpacking the incentive mechanisms and structure, what we learn is that there are four main incentives and investment structures. Number one is the markets. And with the markets, we have price support, for example, playing a leading role, and also market access. Credit access is a minor when it comes to the market incentives. For the non-market incentives, we have mainly consumer acceptance and also providing of research funds. Regulation and compliance incentives, we do have tax breaks, and in some cases also direct payments, and then voluntary standards mainly on certification and sustainability. So looking at the analysis so far, we do have a lot of voluntary standards and also market, but less on non-market regulation and non-compliance. We see divergence between what's happening within the countries. And so for the private sector on the one hand, it's mainly focusing on sustainability standards, voluntary standards, and also certification in terms of incentives and investment. But then on the community side, we see multi actor innovation platforms, which is mainly focusing on core design of activities or participatory guarantee systems, which focuses on building of trust, local networks and knowledge exchange. So we see a dichotomy between the incentive structures and the local structures that exist within the communities and what the private sector is offering. In order to scale agroecology, we need to find a way to merge these two different communities. We also see that largely at the farm level for Peru in cocoa supply chains, if we look at the heat diagram from the top to the down, we see statements 25 and 15, which confirms that they do care about the environment. But then when we come to the lower part, the red side, we do see statements 12 and 16, which shows that this is a major challenge within the countries. So three things are key. First, we need to bridge the incentives and investment gap. We need to build local capacity. We need to understand and unpack the private and public sector engagement sector. And we aim to impact at least 300 households across the different countries and work with local partners. 
this is the fantastic team behind our project. And finally, in order to be able to drive the transition, we need all parties to be on board. The private and public sector will be key and coalition is critical. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And again, thank you to Christine Lini as well for presenting these uh, three projects as part of the uh, transitions program. Um, it is great and exciting to hear all the different components. I think it brings a lot of aspects that are pertinent uh, to now and, and necessary to address a lot of, of the challenges we're facing globally. Uh, with this, I would like to close the first panel. Um, Again, please use the Q&A window, although I do see that people are quite active. Thank you for that. And with that, I would like to pass on to our second panel with our esteemed um, guests. I would like now to present them. Uh, first, we have Vijay Kumar Talam. He's advisor to government of Andhra Pradesh for agricultural and, Co and cooperation. He's in charge of the implementation of Andhra Pradesh community managed natural farming program in India. Uh, welcome, Vijay. I would also like to introduce Pete Van Asten. Um, he's the head of the Sustainable Production Systems Coffee from all of food ingredients, in short, coffee. And lastly, I would like to introduce Patrice Jemen. Uh, he's a research uh, on innovation and agroecology of the Innovation Unit of CIAT. First of all, welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to have you here today. And I would like to discuss some questions with you around what is needed to enable agroecological transitions in practice, but also how can uh, the different drivers really be most effective to achieve large scale change and hopefully also get into what are some of the next steps uh, that we need to continue agroecological transition. I would first like to start with Vijay. Uh, I would like to know a bit more what is an example of an agroecological transition the natural farming program has made at scale and what was the main driver behind this change. Please uh, keep your, your replies short so we can cover all of the questions of this uh, panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Andhra Pradesh is a state with 53 million population, has a long coastline and a, also a large semi-arid area. The motivation for us to go into agroecology or natural farming was the farmer's distress on account of uh, you know, high input prices, frequent crop failures. And we started this program six years ago. We, it was a large scale pilot in 700 villages. We enrolled 40,000 farmers. But over these six years, we've been able to expand the program to cover now more than 600,000 farmers and we reached out to 4,000 villages. That means a footprint of 27% uh, uh, villages and 10% farmers of the state. But in, in the villages that we are having the program, we cover around 60% farmers in these villages. So there is a journey of the farmers in uh, moving from uh, chemical or conventional agriculture to completely natural farming, zero chemical inputs, and uh, we see huge impacts because uh, we would not get farmers to join voluntarily if the impacts were not there. And please keep in mind that we do not provide any financial incentive during the transition, and nor do we assure farmers that they'll get some premium after the transition. But in terms of drivers, I would say the government support, government's ownership of the program gives us this uh, you know, size and scale and ability to convene the different departments. Also, the financial resources are provided by government. But uh, most important is the natural farming knowledge or agroecology knowledge is very close to the farmer's own traditional practices, very close to their heart. So therefore, they're able to accept this uh, change. Uh, but scaling would not have happened but for the immense social capital of the women, uh, rural women, self-help group, women's collectives, and the extension system that we followed, you know, farmer to farmer extension system, and then uh, research. We have collaboration with uh, C4 ICRA, with uh, CIRAD, with many organizations. So I believe research and participatory research with farmers is critical 
to to take this uh, forward and the final driver i believe is the partnership with farmers and other uh, agencies but what i strongly believe is that uh, the it's a behavior change issue so a lot of hand holding is required to to enable farmers to move from the conventional agriculture to natural farming so financial incentives may not have much role to play it is the kind of uh, support for behavior change that is in my opinion very critical thank you thank you very much uh, vj just a follow up question on that um, you mentioned that uh, getting uh, the farmers involved is it's something challenging uh, and you also mentioned that one of the drivers is distress as well so how has the natural farming program really used social movements to achieve the impact at scale and bring together or create these partnerships with with the farmers? Actually, the the scale that we have achieved rests on the social movement. We started a program almost twenty years ago. I was fortunate to lead that program twenty years ago. Was to organize all rural women into collectives. So today in Andhra Pradesh. 8.3 million women in rural areas are organized into collectives into federations and they have a beautiful governance system beautiful planning system monitoring system so once an idea gets into the group they are able to take this far and you know role of women in agriculture is so important in india uh, so therefore the distress is also felt very much by the women so they are able to discuss it in their groups and look at natural farming as a great solution so within the group you know if the leader we actually focus on the leaders self help group leaders so once the leader changes he is able to convince other women not only the women but the whole household has to be convinced because it's a there a lot of uh, you know within the family kind of uh, decision making that needs to be nudged to make this change happen so because they were organized so well this transition process is uh, reduced significantly and among these people we pick up champion uh, you know uh, women farmers and also male farmers to take this process forward so the social movement offers us a platform it's also an engine to drive the program and so it both means an end because after all they are the ones who have to benefit from this and they are driving the program so it's a but for the investment by the government in building this kind of a social platform this scale wouldn't have happened because after all i started the program six years ago and we already reached 10% and our vision is in the next 10 years by 2031 we should have all 6 million farmer families transforming to natural farming so this rests very strongly on the 20 years plus investment in the social capital so there is no shortcut it's not uh, there's no magic formula that uh, these things uh, you know will happen thank you very much vj um i think from my personal point it is really inspiring to hear about this I think this uh, stresses the importance of looking at scale at the local scale and see what's working as well and also empowering farmers and creating these key partnerships I think that's also a key part of agroecology I think I want to um join this aspect the more of a local scale within with the research extensionists no so I would like to go over to you patrice and ask you what are some of examples of an agroecological transition extensionist have supported in west africa at scale and what was the main driver behind this change okay thank you gabi i will give the i will mention the example of uh, uh, farmer managed natural regeneration which is a form of agroforestry very common in many sahelian uh, countries like uh, niger mali or even uh, burkina faso So as I said, it's a form of agroforestry consisting of, of keeping trees, some selecting species of trees in the farm for soil fertility, but also to to feed uh, cattle or even uh, uh, member of household. So this practice has been uh, wide, uh, is widespread now in uh, West Africa, 
and the uh, extension has contributed a lot to make this happen. Uh, the extension contributing to uh, raising awareness of farmers, but also to uh, helping them to address uh, some technical or organizational challenges that was uh, that were appearing from the uh, emerging from the implementation of these techniques. So uh, helping farmers to know to identify the 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 tree species they would like to keep in the farm but also to, to identify the right spacing because when you are having trees in the farm, you still have to grow crops. So you need to know what is the right spacing to avoid competition between crops and, uh, and, uh, and shrubs or, or, or trees. So the, the, the other aspect that is also good to mention is that here the extension as a pluralistic, uh, in this pluralistic form where you have uh, public extension, NGOs, uh, they were very active. But you also have a, a farmer to farmer extension that plays a very important, um, very important role to to the spread of this uh, of this practice. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patrice. I think uh, the, your last point in terms of there is different types of extensionism it, it's key. And in terms of that, I want to to hear a bit more on how have extensionists, these different uh, types of extensionists, perhaps from different points of views in West Africa, use metrics, digital uh, tools, or engage private or public sector incentives and investments to to achieve impact at scale. Okay, so so far extensionists have been using uh, metrics mostly for M and E to monitor processes like the number of uh, uh, dem demonstration plot established, the number of farm outreach, and uh, uh, more recently to, to, make sure if, to make sure that they are keeping the targets in terms of the diversity of the, of the farmer they are reaching. Uh, in many interventions, I mean, we have a, a threshold or a target in terms of number of uh, women that should be reached, generally about 30% 30, 30 or even 40% in some recent projects, but also in terms of youth, how many youth we are, we are reaching. But in terms of outcomes or uh, monitoring outcomes, I think there is still a lot to be done in this uh, in this aspect. And uh, there is one recent work that FAO did recently. Uh, they developed a indicator framework for extensionists. This will be very useful in this particular context because extensionists are missing uh, right tools to do the the, the &E. On the digital tools, I will say this is a this is an area where things are changing very fast. So far, uh, IT tools were used mostly to for dissemination of information, like to give information about um, rainfall, or even to to interact with farmers that are remotely. Explain to them how to do organic manure and all this. But what we are seeing now that is very interesting is that IT applications are being used for learning, for peer learning, to exchange among different uh, different farmers who are engaged in agroecology like uh, WhatsApp groups uh, involving many farmers and even extensionists discussing about what experimentation they are conducting in their own farm or new practices that they are developing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patrice. I think yeah, with that answer, you've already uh, referred to some of the questions that are uh, right now in the Q&A uh, window, um, especially on the different tools that are being used at the moment. But uh, I would like to actually pass on to Pete and hear a bit more on the on the private sector side. Uh, what have been some of the agroecological, what are some of examples of an agroecological transition Ofi has made at scale at, in food coffee systems and what have been the main drivers behind this change? Yeah, thanks Gabby. And, and first of all, you know, really honored, you know, here to, to be able to contribute, of course, but also learn, you know, from, from passionate and knowledgeable colleagues like Vijay here and, and Patrice, really inspiring. So I think, you know, of course, I mean, how do you define an agroecological transition? I was just, you know, scratching my head, you know, when I want to give an example. But I think, you know, some of the things that we have definitely changed uh, quite strongly over the last years uh, across uh, the company, you know, and globally across our supply chains, whether that's cocoa, you know, in West Africa or coffee in Vietnam, you know, it wouldn't really matter. We, we really try to move away, you know, from uh, blanket, recommendations, for example, and also from standard demonstration plots. So I think Fergus, I know already 10 years ago, I think I heard him talking about options by context, and that's exactly what we are doing, right? So we first want to understand the environment. Um, let's say, for example, I talk about coffee. 
if I want to basically, you know, have an agroecological transition in Brazil with coffee, then it's really, you know, about reducing the pesticide and the, and the fertilizer use, you know, the overuse in, 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 in very intensively managed coffee uh, systems and try to think, you know, how to build in more biodiversity within the field, you know, enable to reduce pesticides, you know, improve nutrient recycling, that's cover crops, you know, it's working with natural predators. So that would be, for example, the, the agroecological transition that we would try to instigate, right, in Brazil coffee. If I would go to East Congo on the slopes, you know, of, of, uh, of uh, the mountains near Cahuzi Biega National Park, you know, where we have the gorillas, then we've got a lot of erosion, right, and we have farmers that don't have money even for fertilizer. So it's really, you know, about erosion control, uh, you know, grass burns, but that me makes me think about, you know, small livestock that you can use the grass burns, about nutrient recycling, et cetera, right? So, so what is an agroecological transition in Brazil coffee farmer is something very different from what that transition means, right? Maybe in Congo. So that's the first thing is environment. And second thing that I think is, you know, understanding, of course, the farmer and already the colleagues have talked about it, also take much more of a stepwise approach. You know, what we often have been doing in the past, and I heard the word today as well, demo plots, it's good, but in the demo plots, often we try to bring all the good technologies together, right, and get the highest yield. And then everybody comes and claps, you know, for the demo plot. But farmers, if they would use these fertilizers, for example, or this high level of input, and they wouldn't have managed their canopies or rejuvenated their canopies or the plant densities right, they would just be wasting resources, right? So, in fact, in many cases, you know, you have to do what's the next level best step, right, for your agronomy. Uh, intervention and so really see that differently for different farmers for some farmers they might go for more intensified production for some farmers it's really just about pruning or rejuvenation right what drives that within our company cost first of all right we do a lot of uh, outreach to farmers which cost a lot of money and we're a private sector company right so we need to have the volume we need to have the sustainability traits of that coffee or cocoa that we buy and so you know we need to be as cost effective so that but also customer demand, right? So now these sustainability traits of the product that we sell, you know, these attributes become increasingly important uh, for our customers. So of course, if we do blanket approaches and we are not being very efficient, then definitely, you know, that will give us, you know, footprints, for example, that would not be attractive to our customers. So I think, yeah, these are the drivers. Thank you very much, Pete. I think you summarized uh, in a very short uh, answer what a transdisciplinary process is. And I think your your question on how to define an um, an agroecological transition pathway is a is a challenge or a question. I think we most of us have. Um, but you said it right that we have to understand the environment and the context. And yet again, we go back to the scale and 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 the importance of the context to really define the next steps. But uh, again, also on the partnerships that BJ and Patrice also stressed, you know, the importance of creating those partnerships. I think with that, uh, I want to ask you, you know, from 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 an off from the perspective of Offi, how have you used metrics, digital tools, or engage private or public sector incentives and investments to achieve uh, some of this agroecological or sustainable agricultural impact at scale that you're mentioning? No, no. I mean, we we capture quite a lot of data. So first of all, we have our own internal, you know, uh, system to try to monitor farms. So we would revisit them every year, you know, then of course ask lots of questions. So that's called OFIS, Olam Farm Information System. But then, you know, that's that's of course quite costly because you have to send the technicians, do surveys, you know, observe in the field what practices have been adopted, why not, uh, you know, with which farmer typologies have done that and why why others have done well and not. But then also there is the data which actually we increasingly want to rely on, which is that is being collected by farmers, right? So we have Olam Direct, which is also you know an opportunity for uh, direct procurement from farmers and so farmers also when they download these apps they get information right around you know uh, uh, climate you know agronomic practices so these two let's say data sources what comes from the farmer directly and what we capture goes into our sustainability platform which is called AdSource. there we have a digital footprint calculator around water around you know carbon and with that of course we actually then you know uh, calculate the carbon footprints also of these of these products right then that really, you know, is driving at the moment, you know, the investment. There is a lot of um, CEOs, you know, of, of our our customers, right? The companies that we sell to big chocolate uh, coffee uh, processors, you know, that you consume the products from. They all have come out, right, with, with quite massive statements around what they want to achieve in terms of carbon, in terms of region act, for example, as well. 
So of course, that means that we need to have those metrics. And um, yeah, using that, of course, when we when we get these metrics, it's also to try to increase, of course, that what I think Jonathan was mentioning, the transparency and the traceability is becoming very important. And of course, the confidence then in this data. And then subsequently, right, they can see, okay, what part of their supply chain has what kind of footprint and what would be the best entry points to try to improve, you know, the, the attributes of the product that they want to buy from us, right? So metrics and the transparency of those metrics and the traceability becomes very important in the way now how we engage with our customers and propose, you know, our products. Thank you very much, Pete. It's uh, really interesting to hear more about in detail on, on what the tools are that, that you use. And I, I think now, I mean, I would love to discuss more on some of these topics uh, specifically, but due to time limit, I would like to go ahead and have some closing remarks from each of you uh, to understand what you think are the next steps needed to continue the agroecological transition. So I'll start with you, Vijay. Uh, please keep it uh, one minute. Uh, and please let us know uh, what you think on this in terms of the perspective of natural farming program. Uh, for me, the priority is to reach all the 6 million farmer households. So we are at 600,000. So we are at 10%. So how do I reach all farmers? And how do we enable them to make this transition to a chemical-free agriculture or horticulture? At the same time, where in the villages where we are already present, how do we ensure these villages become bio-villages? so that all the benefits of agroecology, and they then become the drivers for the next set of uh, villages. So I have a long-term priority, but also have a immediate uh, priority. The third priority for me is to see that this translates to greater consumption of natural farming foods by the farmers and by the landless farm workers. So we are looking again at the women's groups, the collectives, farmers' organizations, to drive this uh, consumption so that requires some processing at the village level, local markets. So it's not just for sale, it's for uh, local consumption. So we want to bring out in this context the link between good food and uh, health, health of the health and nutrition integrity uh, of the farmers and their uh, households. I have many more, but then I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Vijay. Um, over to you, Patrice. Thank you, Gabi. For me, I see three things uh, that are very complementary. The first one is the strategic orientation and objective. I think uh, extension should now focus more on sustainability than on productivity. The, 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 the most important thing is not to raise yields or income, but really to achieve sustainability, which means that uh, having a more systemic approach and working also on achieving um, a social or environmental uh, outcomes for, for farmers. So for me, this is the first thing, moving from productivity to sustainability. The, the second thing to do is to make sure that extension system and uh, staff are capacitated. It means they have the, the, the understanding of what agro agroecology is. We, we, we saw in the presentations the 13 principles, but what does, what, what does this uh, 13 principles means, means in practical? For an extension staff, what are, what is equity? What is connectivity? We need to to give them the capacity and the the tools and the approaches to really deal with uh, with this. So uh, methods and tools and methods and tools are, are very key. And lastly, it is targeting. If you are want really want to achieve agroecology to put it at scale, it means we need to involve more women and youth. Not only uh, so far we have been just considering them in term, in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, they are thirty percent or forty percent, but we need to really consider their specific needs. If we don't consider the address the needs, specific needs of uh, women and youth, it will be very difficult to put agriculture on at scale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrice. And again, VJ, I think great points on that also on how to make uh, these principles more applicable to the context. Again, the, the, the name of context, no? But now I would like to hear from you, Pete, to already close the second panel. Thanks, Gabby. So I think, you know, on next step from the private sector perspective, you know, I think we need to keep it super simple. When you actually listen to this 
presentations, right? And the people are like, wow, it's so complex. There is the social dimension, of course, you know, there is, and they're all very valid points, right? But if you want to engage with the private sector, you have to keep it super simple sometimes, you know? So I think it's important that we make very good, you know, examples of what it means. And there sometimes, of course, we can dive into that uh, complexity. I think uh, uh, when I was hearing Christine, you know, about metrics and novel metrics, I thought, oh, it's good, you know, on the other hand, uh, not too many databases, not too many novel metrics, right? How can we use existing metrics and methods to capture these metrics, right? Because the moment that you say to everybody, go and collect more data, then, you know, it just basically, it kills the process sometimes from the private sector side, right? So I think uh, on that last point, and actually as well, for data collection, right, or using the private sector, I think it's important to try to create some alignment or maybe to use sometimes existing waves or buzzwords. You know, now here we talk about agroecology. I know you've all heard about a lot about regenerated agriculture and some people have said, yeah, but that doesn't have enough, you know, the social dimension. Others, you know, like Unilever even have a lot of livelihoods and social dimensions in region ag, right? So I'm sitting here as private sector and I'm hearing region ag, region ag, regenerative agriculture. And now I'm sitting with a group largely, you know, composed of scientists and people that are more on the public side and they talk about agroecological transition. And I'm saying like, hmm, as a private sector, why don't you basically ride that wave, right? Use it and come, Vijay, I really love your examples, right? Show also what is the link between, you know, the social capital and the improvement, the quality of the food as well, right? As you make these transitions so that the consumers in the end, you know, actually sees the benefits. So I think that's the farm to fork communication, right? So I feel that there are a lot of good elements that you have, but when you basically want to use the private sector um, money and energy and drivers, you probably have to somehow see how to filter some of that complexity and 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 ride the wave, you know, of of a regenerative agriculture, of carbon uh, uh, footprints, you know, and carbon footprint reductions. Because I think that's where you probably be able to leverage more private sector capital and and harness more of those partnerships. So yeah, that's my reflection. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pete. I think, um, and again, thank you to Patrice and BJ. I think. There have been a lot of key points mentioned here. Again, um, I would love to have a lot more time to discuss uh, each of these points, uh, but unfortunately we have to move over to our Q&A questions. Um, so once again, thank you very much. Uh, it's enriching to hear the different perspectives. Now uh, we would like to open the space for the Q&A questions. Um, I just want to give a small remark. Uh, we know there's many questions going on Q&A, which is exciting to see the, the involvement and, and, and the discussions going on. Uh, but given the time limitation, we will not be able to address all of the questions today. But for those that we will not be able to address today, uh, the team will go over them and answer them in writing um, after the event. So you will receive an email notification with this. Um, now to the... Q&A, I would like to first start to reverting back to panel one. Um, so I think there was a, a big question uh, for uh, all of the topics, and I think it also pertaining to panel two, but I would like to revert this to Lini, uh, that you mentioned uh, the co-creation process of knowledge. Um, so how do you define co-creation of knowledge? How can a co-creation co be introduced as part of metrics prioritization, but also in the identification of digital tools needed and the development of themselves. Yeah, thank you very much. We have uh, two ways of thinking about co-creation. The first is uh, we, we, well, we define first the mini ecosystem of the advisor and the farmer and the um, science or research community. And then we look at the flows of information in that mini digital ecosystem in terms of to what extent is the farmer's context being recognized? To what extent are farmers adapting uh, information that they find in these systems. And then the last is to what extent uh, it's being validated by both the scientist and the, the farmer. And then we're looking at the um, also the relevance. So first is to what extent these in, this information is flowing. And then the second is uh, the relevance of the practices uh, to farmers contexts. Um, we have a series of indicators also that we used for the assessment of the digital tools. And uh, we're publishing that database, by the way, next week. And so you can see the indicators that we used uh, when we publish it, and we'll make sure that's sent to all participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lini. And I think a follow-up question uh, would be that you mentioned that uh, you already did a study. So um, uh, the, the audience was wondering what kinds of tools that you use in the group you presented um, 
it would be great to see the exploration of how to include the t digital tools here. Right. So uh, I said we um, looked at 200 different tools. Um, those were all publicly available tools on the internet. And we looked at what was relevant to technical assistance and performance assessment specifically. And then uh, from that, the 44 tools that were agroecological, some examples were um, one was the Melissa chatbot that provides agroclimatic forecasts for farms. Another is uh, Digital Greens community videos where farmers are uh, videoing best practices and then sharing that uh, digitally. And a third is Cubic A, which provides a hotline in local languages for farmers to get technical assistance. Perfect, thank you very much, Lini. Um, and I would like to now revert to uh, Christine. Uh, there was a question on what are some ways that we can make sure that farmers see benefits from the expansion of metrics? Yeah, great question, Gabby, and, and to the audience for asking that one. I think farmers' metrics, the ways that farmers evaluate and assess the viability of different practices is one of the key elements we actually want to bring into the metrics project to make sure that how a farmer would assess success um, of agroecology is actually captured and fed back to decision makers, whether they're individual land managers or whether it's, say, government or project managers at other levels, so that the metrics that really matter to farmers are also the ones that are being captured in different data collection efforts and, and as key performance indicators of, of food systems. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Um, and I think this kind of uh, connects to another question, uh, which your closing statement of your presentation, which is the importance of measuring what matters in agricultural system is one side of the issue. Are you working with conventional systems to make some measurements to evidence their negative impacts and have comparisons? Yeah, and we are. So within the within all of the the projects that we'll be working in, one of the key things we need to be able to do is, is assess the impact of different agroecological approaches or, or different farming systems. And so we'll be working both with, I would say, agro, more agroecological and less agroecological farms within all of those systems. We don't always have comparisons of conventional and agroecological especially when, um, say, in African farming systems, which I'm more familiar with, you often have a spectrum of farming systems going on at any one time. And it's not so much that one is agroecological and one is not, it's that there are different types and extents of agroecological practices happening at, in different farming systems. So we're working with metrics to both be able to assess Yes, sort of more conventional and more agroecological farms, but also this spectrum of, of actual farming diversity that we see in, in many of the places where we work. Perfect, thank you very much, Christine. And uh, we were talking beforehand about digital tools and I wanted to go uh, over to Patrice to go more into the, the context. Uh, many of the speakers today have talked about the importance of digital tools for scaling up agroecology. You mention it from the perspective of the extensionists. Um, so the question is, how successful are we so far in making use of available digital resources, especially the farmer to farmer agroecological agroecology videos? Uh, yeah, uh, I think this is an area where uh, that is progressing uh, very fast. We don't yet have enough data, enough. Uh, an assessment on how far, how efficient is it, or how sustainable that could be. But we can say that it's very promising uh, from what from what we are doing within the some of the project called Aquatap, which is strengthening extension and advisory services for to facilitate agroecology transition. We found that farmers are using videos to share their experiences, to share what they are doing. Um, we are also supporting them to to extend more through platforms like WhatsApp and uh, all these. But we don't yet have enough data to know how efficient this is. But we can see that this is an area, this is uh, what, what we are doing through the videos or through the WhatsApp groups is really filling a gap because, you know, farmers, uh, they learn more by what they see than what they heard. So when they see what the other farmers is doing through a video, they can learn more and they can also 
uh, exchange or maybe even produce their own video to send, this is how I'm doing in my own farm. Yes, I swear that you are doing that way, but in my own context, this is the way I'm, uh, I'm doing. So we are trying to, to promote that. So this is studying uh, presently ongoing in Benin, where we are monitoring that. And maybe uh, by the end of next year, we should have some uh, good data to, to share. But for, for the time being, we don't have uh, enough data to, to, to go a final conclusion on that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patrice. And now I want to jump to another topic. And I think this is a, a very interesting one. And I might revert it to you, Vijay, because you mentioned behavioral change as part of the of the nature farming program. So how do you measure behavior change when it comes to attitude change towards agroecological farming? What have you seen in terms of from the perspective of the natural uh, farming uh, program? Well, this is the most important aspect because for 50, 60 years, farmers have been told that if you don't use chemicals, you can't raise the crops. Whereas in the natural farming paradigm, we are advocating that you don't need to use any chemicals whatsoever. So that journey, and that's the reason why I mentioned the role of a champion farmer, a farmer who has already made the journey. So this farmer, we support them with digital tools. So we're not very sure digital tools on their own will do the work, but a champion farmer plus digital tools really accelerates the behavior change. And so we have a several levels of monitoring. First, the, the farmers groups themselves monitor the changes in their own behavior. And that's one of the you know uh, performance measurements for the extension agent as to how many farmers in her group or his group have made the transition, how many have given up, completely given up chemicals, how many have given up partially, and what have they learned from this? And our idea is that the transition process should be without any losses to the farmers. So we find that the cost reduction is very significant. And once their practices uh, improve in a season or two, they also get higher yields. So that's a very good signal for the transition that A, their costs are coming down, B, their yields are going up, they use less water, we are finding about 50% reduction in water usage, the soil has improved, biodiversity has improved. I think there are many metrics which farmers themselves use to drive the transition. It's not just what we are capturing. It is, you know, the decision making of individual farmers, they have their own methodology for taking these decisions. So, and we should respect that. And as long as we, we are, you know, we see that the movement is in the positive direction. It is through a lot of discussions. In fact, very difficult, you know, the husband may want to practice conventional agriculture, the wife wants to do natural farming. So there is a, first of all, a, a discussion within the household, which is again facilitated by the champion farmer. So behavior change, you know, because it's all in the mind and also conditioned by the family, by the neighbors. So it's very difficult to break out of this 50, 60 years of indoctrination. And you know the media is full of conventional advertisements for conventional agriculture, the agriculture scientists, the agriculture department. So they're all advocating the same. They're all saying the more. But if you ask any of the agriculture scientists what kind of food they would like to eat, they would prefer to eat the food grown by a natural farmer. Uh, so there's a lot of contradictions in society, which is actually having this kind of negative impact on the transformation. So behavior change is not just at the farmer level, behavior change at uh, the researchers levels, agriculture research, agriculture, you know, government functionaries, universities. So there's a change required at every level. And in my opinion, it's an iterative process, you know, when farmers change and they're able to influence other farmers, that also influences the, the bigger system. So my own approach is an iterative approach. Thank you, Vijay. I think that's a, a very good answer and, and a very detailed in terms of that. And I think it's great to hear it from, from already a, a program that is in place and it's working on ground. And I think um, in terms of behavioral change, there is a, a topic in terms of metric adoption. Um, and I think there's a question from a dear colleague of mine, uh, which asks, what do you call an agricultural adoption use at the level of a given farm? 
Um, is it 100% use on a farmer realistic or even relevant target, uh, considering the diversity of farmers' objectives? I think it would be great to hear from both you, V, in, in terms of uh, the more on the ground perspective, and perhaps Christine, you can add on that afterwards. Uh, we have a graduation process, uh, Gabriela. So we, uh, our first point of graduation is that the entire farm is chemical free. That's a very important uh, landmark. Then, you know, whether trees, crop biodiversity is being added. So whether the land equivalent ratios are going up, that means is the farmer able to get more or cropping intensity is going up. So there's a graduation process. So it's not, uh, you know, zero, one, not binary. And then different farmers after a certain stage also have multiple pathways. There are farmers who go into having trees, other farmers get into livestock, others who get into dairy. So it's entirely up to them. But for us, the most important indicator is whether farmers have got rid of chemicals. For us, that is the, the uh, what shall we say, the basic acceptable level of graduation. Beyond that, of course, it is a bonus. Over to you. Thank you, Vijay. Um, Patrice, perhaps you want to add in, in, in terms of, of your experience. You're on mute, Patrice. Okay. The question is about the, the coexistence of uh, uh, natural farming and uh, conventional farming, if I get you well. Yeah. Adoption of the agroecological uh, metrics. Um, yes. Uh, how do you see it in terms of the extensions point of view? Yeah, I, I think um, they, they, uh, they, they are two, they are, they are two or three levels of about the metrics. They are the, the first level is with farmers. How do we conduct a, a joint process where farmer recognize himself? Uh, and use the metrics to make sure that we are on the right track, that we are really doing things that are that are useful for the for the farmer, for the farmers. So for me, that's the first level. The second level is between the extensionist and the, the manager of the extension organization, because you cannot assess an extension who, who is doing, uh, who is promoting uh, agroecology with the same criteria you will use to assess an extension who is promoting conventional farming. So you need to adopt the matrix uh, about to, to to, 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 to follow or to, to support the work the extension guy is, is doing. And then lastly, it's about the, the policy, the decision makers. Uh, during several workshops workshops you organize here, uh, decision makers always ask, yes, you, you mentioned that agroecology is, is good, but why should we invest in agroecology? Why should we invest? Is it not something from, is it not, is it not a top down, top down approach? Is it not something coming from the North and uh, pushing us to do it? Uh, what why what are the reasons we should promote it here? So we think I think we really need to come up with some strong uh, uh, some strong indicators to demonstrate to the decision makers that yes, it's is is worth to to support uh, agroecology and this can help to contribute to the livelihood to the sustainability of, of farmers. So so far uh, there are not yet a lot of metrics that can help us to address that question. But we are working to develop some in the framework of the project we are implementing now. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrice Vijay. Yes. I just wanted to jump in saying that resilience is turning out to be a very good motivator. Mm -hmm. We have had a very heavy rainfall, and then we find that our farmers' fields are intact, and neighboring farmers' fields are completely damaged, or the farmers' natural farming is able to withstand droughts. So the shocks. The ability to withstand shocks, we are seeing as a very big uh, motivation. And from the women's point of view, the fact that the food is uh, more healthy, nutritious. So there are multiple drivers of uh, this and multiple levels of uh, metrics. Yeah, so that if I can, one, one last point, just two seconds. I will say that in many places in West Africa, uh, there are a lot of farming practices that are almost already agroecological, like uh, uh, land plowing or not using plow. There are many practices that are already, uh, uh, very close to agroecology. Now, the, 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 what we need to do is to convince 
the actors or farmers, but also the children, that these practices are valid, that they are virtuous. Because some are seeing, some, some people are seeing, some actors are seeing these practices as something that is just for poor people who don't have enough means to, to, to procure uh, input or fertilizer or equipment. We need to, there's a, there's a need of change of mindset because uh, uh, West Africa agriculture is basically very close to, our, to our ecology. Now is to convince people that there are a lot of uh, benefits in continuing that way and to see how to improve, how to improve it. Because so far, even if, if it's close to our ecology, it's not yet able to fit the to fit uh, the demands in terms of food, in terms of environment. So there is a need to some innovations to improve it, to improve the performance. Yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you very much, Patrice. Uh, I think Patrice and Vijay, you've uh, mentioned a lot of key points. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna move to another question um, over to Pete. Um, and there is a question for you specifically on what kinds of opportunities are there to collaborate on the use of that source? I know that it's a tool available for purchase, but do you have opportunities to work on research, partnership work for agroecological opportunities with NGO or no local national government? Yeah, no, definitely. And we, we have that already, you know, in some landscapes, for example, in some areas, uh, we work together with uh, with public, you know, institutions, NGOs or, or researchers, right? In which case, we can also share the data. But of course, when it comes to, we don't make, of course, this data publicly available because it has a lot of, you know, privacy data from the farmers, you know, uh, their farm size, uh, their names, you know, how much how much yield they had. So, of course, you don't want to make that, you know, just out in the public domain. And of course, there is also sometimes a commercial interest, right, to uh, to map out where you source from, what you source, and how you you don't necessarily want all your competitors to immediately access that information, also, right? But that hasn't stopped us actually from collaborating with uh, with 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 other partners. But we, they should just reach out to us and then say, hey, in this context, I'm hearing that you are working with these kind of farmers. Uh, this would be my interest. Uh, would there be a way, right, to collaborate together? And then definitely we would find. An opportunity right to uh, if we find a common interest and a common objective it would absolutely be possible to to share data we'd have to sign an nda and things but we are absolutely not there to only you know keep it for ourselves i know this uh, statement was earlier there right? digital tools are there to basically feed the big corporates maybe you know bring it central but not bring it to the farmer we definitely want to have it a two-way system right but obviously as a private sector you know you have to you uh, you have to uh, be fair, you know, or, or think carefully about what you can share and when you can share, but we're definitely open to that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pete. And unfortunately, I have to close the Q&A space because uh, we've run a bit over time, but I want to thank everyone on the questions. There are some still uh, questions left to answer, very uh, important ones and, and very interesting ones. So we're gonna revert on these answers via email. Um, and I want to thank also all participants who share their questions in the Q&A window. It was very interesting and I think engaging in terms of the discussion. And once again, thanking uh, the uh, esteemed panelists from panel two. Thank you very much for your participation and your points of view. It was very interesting to hear from each one of you and also thanking panel one for giving um, a more deeper overview of the transitions program. Now I want to revert to the closing remarks to Sara Salastano, uh, Direct Research and Impact Assessment Division uh, from IFAD. Over to you, Sara. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriela. Thank you to all the participants. I connected a little bit before uh, 3 p.m. I'm in Brussels today. So for me, it's 3 p.m. It's 9.30, a thing from the official time of the, of the meeting. Uh, there were more than 170, maybe even 190 participants, which was really exceptional success. So congratulations to the organizer. And I was very, very much pleased to hear the end of the presentation before and also the Q&A and understand how important is the concept of behavioral change into um, uh, innovation, technology, and agroecological transition, and why it is important. And the question that was made before to Vijay, and Vijay, I like very much your, your answer. 
after we've been preaching for so long to use uh, chemical or the right combination of chemical fertilizer, and now we are change, we're telling them to change behavior. And so this will create confusion in the message. So this is true. At the same time, I want to say a few words. Maybe those are, those are things that everybody thinks, but think more seriously, and maybe we can understand how to do change differently. Behavioral change is something relevant, not only in agroecological transition, but also in nutrition problems and also on gender issue, because to change something, it really requires time. And it is not because we have all decided now that we are investing in agroecological transition that this will happen, because it requires the, a combination of effort between demand and supply the producer, but also the techniques that are available. And it's very difficult. And as well as in nutrition to ensure food security and have nutritional change. I mean, you really need to change behavior to have improvement in nutrition and making sure that you're going to reach food security. What about gender? Not only you need behavioral change within the family, but this change that happens within the family and the um, the dynamics between you know, men and women have to be also accepted by the society. So this has to take place with a change in social and uh, social norm. And therefore it's extremely challenging. And I want to make the last comparison then I'm gonna to move to the official uh, closing remark. Healthy diet and unhealthy diet. How long is it taking to people also in developing countries to switch from junk food to healthy food, which is also what is, uh, you know, the results of the of the selfie. Getting rid of junk food that allow in the, the second half of the 19th century to also give a job to women because it, it was because women didn't have to spend their time cooking and they were using processed food that, you know, development took place. And now we're saying back to people, you have to cook and spend your time cooking at home, which is, by the way, something that in Italy, most of the family happens, but it happened, it is happening less and less. And so, you know, there, there are many things. But now uh, I, I hope that this agroecological transition will stimulate more and more conversation around this area, especially in the agricultural sector, because when there is an innovation, an innovation that is bring into agriculture sector, we have to move and follow innovation and to use research to make sure that innov innovative technologies in agriculture can be adopted and then scaled up. So thank you to all the participants for 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 the time that you spent in this um, in this meeting in the era of never ending meeting and uh, um, I really would like in my closing remark to stress the importance of this program for IFAD. And in the last few years, has, IFAD has developed an agroecological strategy and became a strategic partner of the European Commission for the implementation of the program with the CGR and other partners. Transitions program provides IFAD with an opportunity to harness research and technology to contribute to the agro ecology agenda in line with the mandate of the European Commission, IFAD and the CGIR. The transition to agroecology is a process that requires time, but the innovation deployed by the CGR, such as digital tools, holistic matrices, and public-private partnership, new approaches have a great potential to accelerate this transformation and to create value for farmers, national research centers, university development practitioners, policymakers, consumer organizations, and the private sector. IFAD wishes to establish collaboration between transition program and IFAD project in target countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America to promote knowledge exchange and technology update across programs. From transitions, IFAD seeks to derive practical knowledge and how to integrate agroecological metrics and methods in the traceability and transparency blockchain based food supply chain tools, testing and integrating metrics into the transparency and traceability tools to allow users to visualize suppliers in a map interface, show stakeholders action in relevant networks and value chain, promoting transparency and traceability through the adoption, certification and labeling, environmental impact tracking, food product traceability, adapting sustainability practices to local conditions, identifying 
a set of metrics to be included in blockchain-based technology, evaluating the evidence for the benefit of improved incentives and inclusive use of digital tools for farmers to support innovation, public policy goals, investment, and the scalability of benefit. Transitions feature a program that capitalizes on spillover's effect, combining solutions to old challenges such as agriculture productivity, nutrition, and climate smart solutions with digital innovation and new approaches in private sector engagement to inform agroecology policymaking. The interlinkage and joint activities between projects make the program more valuable than the sum of its part, thanks to the synergies and pooled utilization of the knowledge and evidence produced by the single projects. Thanks to the policy-oriented nature of the program and the close linkages with the transformative partnership platform, IFAD wishes to receive food transition base to underpin advocacy and inform policymakers and donors about the environmental and social benefit of agroecological approaches. To conclude, I would like to thank the CGIR for arranging such a stimulating webinar and hope they will be showcasing their work to increase awareness on the challenges and successes of agroecological transition. Over. Thank you again, Sarah. Thank you very much for that great closing. Um, I want to thank you for uh, for being here today. Again, Sarah Savastano, Director of the Research and Impact Assessment Division from IFAD, IFAD as the Managing Donor of the Transitions Program. With this, um, I want to close today's webinar. I think it was interest. I, I hope it was interesting for everyone. As Sarah mentioned, uh, we had over uh, 150 participants, and we had uh, over 100 participants participants throughout the whole webinar. I think the discussions and the Q&A were super uh, engaging and interesting. And I think uh, I agree a lot with Sarah on uh, agroecological transitions being an opportunity to push a lot of the conversations uh, we've been having in, uh, around agroecology and agriculture. So thanking everyone. Uh, thank you for everyone who participated from panel one, but also from panel two. And with this, I wish everyone a good rest of the morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your, on your time zone.